Science on the Menu, a podcast by the European Food Safety Authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Science on the Menu, uh, the podcast series by EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. My name is James Ramsey. I'm the head of communications at EFSA, and today we're going to be talking about a really important public health issue, and that is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and to talk us through this this topic today, uh, we're very happy to be joined by uh, an expert at EFSA, a scientist at EFSA, a vet who specializes in microbiology, Ernesto Liebana. Very warm welcome, Ernesto. Um, how are you today? Hello, James. I'm very well, thank you. What we'd like to do with you today, Ernesto, is for you to share with us uh, your uh, expertise, your understanding, the work you're doing on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so I've got a series of questions for you, but what I'd like to do at the start, just really to put put the whole thing into perspective, um, is to talk a little bit about what we mean by antimicrobial resistance. And maybe the best place to start there is by actually just talking about what antibiotics are. So can you start us off uh, with an answer to that question? Sure. Yes, uh, with pleasure. So the first thing to say is that when we talk about antimicrobials, we're not only covering antibiotics, which are, I think, the substances we will talk about today. So uh, antimicrobials in general are, are substances we use to treat infectious diseases, let it be viral diseases, bacterial diseases, or parasitic diseases. But um, what is the most uh, concerning public health issue uh, right now is the, uh, the problem of resistance to the medicines we use to treat bacterial infections. Those are the ones we call antibiotics. And what are they? Basically, as I said, they are medicines that we uh, administer to people or animals to combat uh, infectious diseases. And uh, they kill bacteria in the vast majority, or some of them inhibit the possibility for the bacteria to grow. Most of them are found in nature, so they are produced by other microorganisms, but also most recently, or, or recently in the last uh, kind of 20, 30 years, some synthetic molecules have also been developed. So this is basically what we call uh, an antimicrobial. And just to put things in perspective, uh, uh, is something that we have been living with for a very short time in history because they were only discovered about 90, 95 years ago. It was when Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. It took a while from the discovery to the use in humans. It took almost 20 years before we learned how to purify and produce enough quantities to treat people with. And then after starting treating the first patient, which happened in 1941, it only took five years before we started seeing problems with uh, these drugs. So it was kind of a miracle uh, molecule. It was uh, helping a lot of people in need, especially during the Second World uh, War. And then Fleming, when he gave his speech in 1945, the Nobel Prize speech, he was already warning at the time that we had to be careful uh, in using that. Really? And Even after just five years? In, after in five years, which is really, really uh, uh. telling uh, how important it is to be uh, prudent uh, about yeah. this wonderful uh, resource that we have. And uh, I mean, so that that um, that challenge, I guess, it's with us still today. I mean, that's why we're here talking about it. Presumably in that period, r the level of resistance somehow has increased or we see more antimicrobial resistance. Presumably that is the case. So uh, basically what happens is that bacteria find ways of coping with uh, this, this threat for them, which is uh, an antimicrobial. And uh, how do they do that? Well, they have uh, different strategies. I'm, I'm talking like if bacteria could think, they can <laughs> not, not, but uh, in a way they are, they are clever. So they could, for example, produce certain proteins with uh, have the ability to eat the antibiotic, to destroy it. And these are kind of enzymes that destroy the, the antibiotic. They can also develop some kind of a pump mechanism. So when the antibiotic gets into the cell, they immediately pump it out. So they, they don't get affected. They may have certain characteristics on their membrane. A bacteria have a kind of a wall uh, around them. And uh, this wall protects them from anything entering, in this case, the antibiotic entering the cell. Or they may find uh, 
alternative ways of using certain uh, substrates for uh, production of energy. Uh, so they, they are living beings, so they need to eat something. And with all these mechanisms, they become resistant. And what this means is that they are able to either survive or even multiply in the presence of these antibiotics. antibiotics yeah. Wow. I mean, bacteria, they know what they're doing to <laughs> to evade uh, these antibiotics. And, and I guess over time, they, you know, they develop uh, this, this strategies in different ways. Exactly. This has existed forever. It's not something that uh, started in the last hundred years, as I said. The problem is uh, when we increase the, the use of these substances, there is uh, out there what we call a selective pressure. So if by chance uh, one of these resistance mechanisms uh, emerge and there is an antibiotic in the immediate vicinity of, of those bacteria, they have a selective advantage. They can grow. The resistant ones can grow, while the ones that we call sensitive, we die with the antibiotic, and then they multiply. And again, they are kind of clever beings in, in a way because they can uh, find ways of exchanging genetic material. And that is how uh, antibiotic resistance spreads. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, the majority of listeners, I think, will be familiar with, uh, you know, the idea, the need to, to use antibiotics prudently in a public health uh, care setting, let's say, you know. Uh, we hear about, uh, I don't know, superbugs in hospitals. We know that there are campaigns, uh, you know, with general practitioners to reduce or not to overprescribe antibiotics. So, and I think, you know, that message at least, uh, you know, it's it's fairly widely diffused. It may not be followed the advice uh, consistently um, uh, everywhere, but. We also use antibiotics, don't we, in agriculture, and um, that may not be as obvious for some for some people. So, could you just explain a little bit how uh, antibiotics are used in an agricultural setting? Sure, they are. Um, they have been used, and they are used uh, nowadays, and with different purposes. Um, one of them, perhaps the less genuine one is uh, using them as what we call growth promoters. So uh, years ago, somebody realized that by giving low levels of antibiotics to animals, um, there was a positive impact in the speed of growth and in what we call feed conversion, meaning that the animals with the same amount of feed were able to grow faster. And that was, uh, in economic terms, a very attractive things, thing for farmers. So they started using some of these molecules as growth promoters. And uh, luckily, this was discontinued in Europe uh, in 2006. And it's one of the things that Europe is really proud about. Uh, although in, in other parts of the world, there is a still use of antibiotics as, as growth promoters. Then the second way they are used is to prevent animal diseases, sometimes done or it was done as a substitute for good husbandry. Uh, so you could treat animals in the right way so that they don't need to take something to prevent they get sick. Again, in Europe, we are quite uh, advanced in, in not using them. There are still certain occasions where it is a, a bit unavoidable to use them. And it's, for example, when we have to operate on, a, on an animal, on a, on a cat or a dog or a horse, as they do with humans. But that level of use is much lower than the one I'm talking about when you use this in a farm, in all the animals, when there is no real need. There is a third way of using them, which is what we call metaphylaxis. It's a kind of complicated word, but what it means is that in a farm you may have a group of animals which are sick and that you need to treat with something. And then you have animals which are in contact with them that may become sick. So what you can do is to treat all the animals to prevent the spread from the sick ones to the uh, healthy ones. So in a way there is a justification for the use of the drug but in a strict sense you are treating healthy individuals which is again not, not ideal. So this metaphylaxis is rather restricted. So if a vet would decide to do that in a farm we have to justify exactly why. And then the, the last more intuitive uh, way we use antibiotics in animals is to treat when they become sick. And, and that is absolutely necessary because it's part of keeping their welfare. Uh, you have to still have something to treat them when they get infectious sure. diseases. Sure. And, and this is what we try to protect, that the resistance do not hit those uh, animal bacteria which cause them uh, disease. And yeah. So, I mean, it seems like there are, um, you know, a couple of uh, policy initiatives or rules in place that have already been made to, to, you know, prevent the overuse of antibiotics in agriculture. You mentioned the phasing out of uh, 
of growth, uh, you know, use for growth promotion. What are what are the alternatives then? You know, if if you're a if you're a farmer or if you're a vet, uh, I mean, what are some of the alternatives to antimicrobials, antibiotics in an agricultural agricultural production uh, system? Okay, let me kind of summarize this in, in, in three areas. As you said, there are policy options or mechanisms that have been put in place. We are not there yet with uh, kind of the ideal situation. So the first of the pillars that is there would be what we call reducing the, the need to use or the level of use of, of these substances. And that can be done by different measures, like, for example, putting uh, industrial sectors in a situation where they would have to report the amount of antibiotics that is used. And then you could compare either sectors or countries or regions. And, and then it would be more and more difficult for those which are high users to continue if they see that their neighbors are equally producing with less amount. So that puts pressure on everybody and this peer pressure helps somehow. Uh, so this is what we call the reducing alternative. But then there is, the, as, as you mentioned, the replacing one, which is trying to find other substances to perhaps um, substitute the antimicrobials w- with them. And, and examples of that would be vaccines, for example. If you could prevent uh, an animal to get a, an in bacterial infection by uh, administration of a vaccine, the animal would not get sick. You would not have to treat, so less antibiotics needed. There are other things that may boost the immune system of the animals, immunomodulators. So this this may be medicines or drugs that you give them to have a, a better immunity. There may be uh, interventions in the way we feed. Uh, we, we give feed to the animals, for example, introducing a certain level of acidification of the feed, meaning that the, the pH, the acid level is high, the pH is low, the bacteria cannot grow that much, and, and this may help the, the digestion also of, of mm-hmm. the animals. So many various, of these things, uh, yeah. various things. And, and then the third kind of area would be rethinking which is really providing all the conditions to these animals to grow and to to be uh, raised in in a way where they have a good welfare that as i mentioned before they have a good biosecurity so that we provide better conditions in general that would help the overall health um, let's say situation of the farm so those three things in combination i think is is what provides an ideal uh, let's say situation to to tackle this this problem of resistance yeah okay you, you mentioned uh, animal welfare there and, and i'll maybe use that as a way to get back a bit to, to what we're doing here at defsa so could you just explain our role uh, you, you know w- what is it that defsa is doing in the area of an- antimicrobial resistance yeah the, the the first very important thing we do is to monitor the situation so the european member states they have to have a look at what is this, the level of resistance in certain bacteria in certain animal species. So they, every year, have to get a number of samples, grow from them uh, a number of bacteria, test them for resistance to antimicrobials, and then report all that data to us. So every year, we get all that data and produce a, a report. And this report is a joint report with our colleagues in ECDC. They do the same thing for humans, and then we put all this data together. ECDC, just for our listeners, is the European Centre for Disease Prevention Control. Correct. Yeah. And and we do this um, with a focus on what we call zoonotic bacteria. So these are bacteria that can be transmitted from animals to humans, either by food or either uh, through, through the environment. So as I said, we have this collection of data, and this allows us also to look year after year how the situation progresses. So we, we calculate what we call trends, and we see if in a given member state or overall in Europe, the situation is improving. But then we also have a very important role in doing risk assessment. So it may be, for example, that a particular resistance type emerges and nobody knows why. And we may be asked, uh, can you have a look at at the situation? Tell us uh, what is to know about this? How can we detect it? How can we prevent it? Uh, Then thirdly, we have a role in communicating everything we do. So the uh, activities like the one we are doing today we are quite active also in translating as far as possible all of this into comprehensible messages. And the last thing that we have been doing, and which is also highly rewarding, is spreading the wisdom of what we learned in Europe over all these years of actions to other places where perhaps they were lagging behind or didn't have the same concern about this. 
Yeah, you, okay, just maybe st- to, to stick on the international aspect for, for a moment. So, um, I mean, obviously at EFSA we're concerned mainly or looking at least uh, mainly at uh, the, the sort of EU picture. How would you characterize the kind of cooperation that happens at a global level? I mean, we know it's widely recognized as a global public health challenge. Are different jurisdictions further ahead of us, uh, behind us? Uh, how are we working together? As you said, this is a global problem and... Uh Unfortunately, you may be very active and putting a lot of effort in, into uh, your immediate geographic location. But if somebody else is not doing the same around you, this can be quickly jeopardized. The access to medicines, the, the need for prescription or not, uh, the use of growth promotion, uh, all, all these things is, are, are very diverse and, and not everybody's let's say, at the same pace. So there are international organizations that are trying at least to have global standards or, or, or um, advise minimum standards for monitoring or for risk assessment, like Codex International, I don't know, FAO, w, WHO, uh, the OIE, uh, now called WOHA. Okay, what's the, the current situation? Also thinking about the trend over, over recent years. I mean, are things improving, generally speaking? Okay, it's a complex uh, question. Um, in some areas, yes, we are improving. You cannot put everything in, in the same basket. If we talk about, for example, levels of general use of antimicrobials, certainly in the animal sector we have seen uh, a constant and a steady decrease in use, which is okay. uh, good news. It's the level of consumption in animals was higher than the level in humans, while now the lines have crossed and it's the other way around. We are seeing this type of, of trends. Uh, the good news is that when we monitor what we call resistance to highly important antibiotics, so these are molecules that we use as last resource when we get really ill uh, and the doctors have to think about what to use, we see that the levels of resistance to those uh, and antibiotics are still low in general, relatively low or, or low in, in Europe. Although we see also differences in different locations like north, south, east or west. So you can still see that there is progress to be made. Unfortunately, the bad news is that to those antibiotics that are very commonly used, the levels of resistance to these common drugs are still high, in some cases even very high. That tells us that this is still a problem and that uh, there is something to to be done there. Uh, And and that is an important message that we should not just give up and continue. The situation did get better in the use. We are still observing important levels of resistance to some. This, This is what we call nowadays a One Health approach. And I think it's clear that Unless all of this uh, is taken care of, because it's all connected, we would never succeed. Mechanisms. Yeah. So we have to be watching out really that there is not a change in, in that, because that would be a disaster. Yeah. Would one solution not be just to develop new antibiotics? Uh, I think, uh, again, there was what is called the golden uh era of antibiotics where a lot of new molecules were discovered and they were put in the market and history has told us that for every single one of those it's a matter of years before you start seeing resistance. So it is not a very attractive, let's say, um, avenue for any pharmaceutical company because they will be investing heavily to produce something that as soon as it is used in the market, first you have to promote using it as conservatively as possible. And second, you know that sooner or later uh, your product is going to fail. So the thinking is that, yes, we have to find in this society ways to help industry in finding out new ones, but we have to really protect the ones we have as gold because it's not going to be a quick uh, fix. Thanks very much, Ernesto. Um, I mean, you've really given us a great uh, overview and insight into um, you know the challenge, the public health challenge that is antimicrobial resistance. Maybe just before we close, um, you know, I could ask you if you were to pass one simple message, or you know, you wanted to convey something that you think is really important on this topic. What would it be? Okay, let me think a bit. Um, I think what would be really important is that our efforts in tackling this problem are sustained in time. Uh, it's not we cannot expect quick results. We have to be perseverant, and because. All of this is connected, it's connected uh, to humans, it's connected to the environment, it's a complex uh, uh, issue that does not have a single answer. I think 
what is really important is that everybody contributes. So that's all we have time for today, listeners. Thanks very much for joining us again on this podcast series, uh, Science on the Menu. If you are enjoying what you hear, please feel free to subscribe. And if you want more information about antimicrobial resistance, do check out what we have on our website. You can also find more on the website and the podcast of our sister agency, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Thank you very much again and see you next time.